This is Jessica. And this is Kelly. And this is the Chasing Brighter podcast. Hello and welcome everyone today and joining us is our guest Laura Deitch, licensed clinical professional counselor and clinical sexologist. For more than a decade, Laura has worked with diverse groups of people in the Las Vegas community on health education, social, reproductive justice, and mental health issues. Now she's parlayed those skills and her counseling degree into being an amazing mental health therapist. Her past work history includes community needs assessment projects, strategic planning, curriculum development, individual and group counseling and education, community resource referrals, and coalition building. She also is an advocate for sexual education within the Clark County School District. Welcome, Laura. We're so excited to have you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, we want to get into it. You know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, so much for the month of February, we're talking about connection. And um, we read this wonderful book by Dr. Frank Lipman. Um, and he talks so much about how important physical touches and um, connection with others. And so we wanted to really focus on connection. And, and today, you know, physical and sexual intimacy as well. Um, and we'd love to hear a little bit about your practice, your current area of focus and kind of what inspired you to focus on sexual health? Okay, I would love that. So, you know, one of the most interesting things that happens in my practice is that folks come in and there's either been a disconnect or there's a disparate drive in um, sexual interest or there's been a trauma or, um, or there's been some revelation that there's shame in, in one or both partners. And one of the things that's so helpful is kind of figuring out what are people's thoughts and values and attitudes about sex, about their bodies, about intimacy, and, and being able to share those in a, in a safe and inviting way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, are you exclusively seeing, um, couples or, or individuals or who are you kind of seeing right now? That's a great question. So actually my practice is primarily individuals. Mm -hmm. My background, what led me here was about 15 years of teaching sex ed in the greater Clark County area. And then going back to school and getting a drink, a degree in counseling, because I realized that so many of the young people that I was meeting and doing education with actually had trauma related issues or family of origin, shame issues, religious trauma, things like that. And I could only go so far as an educator and I really wanted to do more. Hmm. So I ended up translating that into working at the local rape crisis center and working with folks around trauma and um, healing from sexual assault. And so my, my practice primarily is individuals. I work very much and very closely with the LGBTQIAA community. And so about half my practice is trans folks. Hmm. So that kind of organically started to happen for you. It, it did. It did. It started to organically happen. I was sought out by the executive director of the Rape Crisis Center who knew me through my work at Planned Parenthood and knew that I was doing counseling stuff. And then because I have a doctorate in human sexuality, I can... So when a trans person um, is looking for gender affirmation surgery or gender congruence surgery, they need these letters because of the insurance gatekeeping system. But that's a whole separate thing. But I can write letters for surgeries, and th there are not a lot of practitioners in town who can do that. So my practice has grown as a result of that for being kind of a go-to person here in town. Um, in terms of the individual, however, what I've found is that there's so many different avenues and sources where people's attitudes and values are shaped, the media, family of origin, religion, um, experience, trauma. And we, we come up with these ideas and these thoughts in our heads and these values, self-concept that, that lead to so much shame. And then it becomes so crippling. And so in my individual work with folks, we can address that and kind of tackle it head on. And then if it turns out that there's a partner involved or they are partnered or they get a partner, we can invite them into the process to sort of apply what they've done in individual work into that relationship. 
I also do see couples in terms of if there's a specific need and they really are looking to bolster their sex life or one partner's interested, let's say, in what's called consensual non-monogamy. So that can be swinging, that can be cuckolding, that can be an open relationship, that can be polyamory. It can be a lot of different things. And I help folks navigate those conversations and figure out what's going to work for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's coming up in my practice so much more too. And then I'm always, you know, learning more and educating myself. And there was a time where I was trying to listen to every sex therapist podcast I could because an individual, right. You don't always like lots of stuff comes up, you know, I know Kelly and I are coming at this as well. So um, we're sisters born and raised relatively most of their life in rural Kansas and raised Catholic, going to Catholic school, very small Catholic school. I don't necessarily, and Kelly would have different experience about like um, sex was negative in our home, but it was very much like sex is for procreation and for after marriage you know, I, and that's it. And I was telling my daughter, I was like, well, it was kind of like, don't ever have sex ever, ever, ever. Oh, you're married. Okay. Have sex. It's pleasurable. What? You know? Like, and so I was like, uh, and so I use a term and I don't even know if this is a term. I read it or I made it up, whatever, but like sex positive, that's what I'm looking for is to raise mm-hmm. sex positive kids where it's just like sex is natural and normal and pleasurable and um like free of shame and i was telling a girlfriend i was like oh i want to raise sex positive kids i think she was she's like your daughter's 14 or and i was like no i'm not saying like that i want that i'm like go have sex everywhere with everybody you want but i was like but i want it to be uh guided by her and not like i i've had friends who you know just had like a one night stand or don't just you know found sex pleasurable and didn't have any guilt or shame or anything associated. So that's like my goal for my kids. And so I know Kelly and I talk about that, right. Trying to um, ourselves become sex positive and then raising sex. positive. Well, and kids. even just the using the word sex, right. It <laughs> seems kind of like a, hey, that's a level of discomfort for me just because I did feel like I grew up with so much shame, but also it seems like it's like, we use the term for a lot of different things. And really, it has a hugely broad meaning in some way. And when you think about sex versus like just pleasure is one of the things that I feel like just to your point, as we've gotten older and a little wiser, that, um, you know, pleasure can be many, many different things. It doesn't just have to be sex and sex isn't just sex either, you know, So true. And in terms of talking about sex positivity, that's, you know, definitely a popular term. And, and, you know, I love that you either found it or are using it and, and that it does embrace so many things. And it, it, I'm happy that that term is, is getting greater reach and having a ripple effect because I mean, really think about the opposite sex negative. Is that what we want out there? That's just crazy. Right. Sex is such an, an, an integral part of our lives and mm-hmm. it's ubiquitous in our culture. So to me, a lot of the background and a lot of the foundational pieces are about values. So figuring out what are a person's or a family's values around sex. And what's fascinating to me is uh, upon talking with so many folks over the past you know, 25 years that have been in this industry between education and therapy, mm-hmm. There's such a there's such a common theme of, well, in my insert blank culture, whatever it is, in my black culture, in my Latino culture, in my white culture, in my Catholic culture, it doesn't matter what the culture is. What I hear over and over again is we, we, we just don't talk about it. I'm like, oh, sweet pea. There's not a, really a big culture that I found that does talk about it. <laughs> So this this myth that that, that that we're alone in our lack of talking about it, that's American culture. That's Western mm. culture. That is puritanical culture. And we're all part of it here. Mm. Yeah. So one of the interesting things I and that comes up is that idea of that no message. I well, I get people who say, Well, I never heard anything negative, or nobody ever told me it was bad, or nobody ever shamed me. And I said, Oh, okay, great. What were the messages you remember hearing? And then it's deafening silence. And what we need to remember is that in and of itself is a message. Yeah. If you can't talk about it, if you won't talk about it, if you don't talk about it, then clearly there's something to be ashamed of or scared of or that is not okay or safe 
to talk about. And I wish that that would be the starting place for folks to kind of come to and realize as awkward and scary as it is for people and parents to have those conversations, it's better to say something than nothing. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say also, um, kids pick up on so much stuff so much sooner than we all realize. And if they don't learn about it at home, they're going to fill in the gaps based on what they hear. Right. Right. And they have so much access to so many different kinds of information so quickly and so unfettered and so unfiltered Then, then we, I mean, I'm, I'm 52. So I, I literally, you know, grew up with, I went all through high school without internet. That was not a thing mm. until I was in college. <laughs> yeah. Right. We forget so, about that. We forget yeah. about the things that we didn't have. And so they have all this access. So they grow up, you know, literally from the time they can hold a phone, they have access to, you know, porn and and all kinds of just things that are not necessarily accurate, helpful or healthy or safe. And we've got to work at combating that and providing a counterbalance to those messages that they're able to access so, un, you know, unsupervised. I read um, Peggy Ornstein's book, Girls and Sex. And then I, I have Boys and Sex. I haven't got to it yet. And I loved um, that there were kind of, I felt like recommendations and solutions to help girls in hookup culture. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm trying to be so proactive with my daughter that she's like, oh, I'm on a date. I really owe him something. So I'll just, you know, give him a blowjob real quick. So I don't want to have sex, but I don't want him to be unhappy or whatever. And I was like, you know, like girls aren't, and I, that's where I think the pleasure component comes from, like aren't, haven't had, I forgot the percentage, but aren't having orgasms. Yeah. Didn't, don't even know how to have, you know, like they're, and then there were girls that were watching porn because they're like, oh, I want to know about sex and know what it's like so I can be prepared. It's like, that's not the place <laughs> to go to find out about sex. And I, I had even, um, I no longer work with children and adolescents, but I had a kid. It had to have been eight or nine years ago, um, watching pornography as young as seven, like just having access to it. So, and that, I mean, that's almost a decade ago, you know? And so I know people want to say, you know, not my kid or there, I watch them or there's locks or whatever, but it's like very easy to click, click, click and get on something. And I think like you're saying, it's just that at least, um, even though it's, you know, uncomfortable, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's uncomfortable for me. I think it's more like I don't have a this enormous knowledge base because I yeah wasn't I think that's a great point things yeah you know but at least I'm asking at least I'm talking about it. it's like well if you want to talk to me let's talk about it let's find it together let's get a book and um, Kelly and I have the book uh, it's perfectly normal it was a new one we oh. just got I know Kelly got it too and I opened it up and right away it was like cartoons as expositions and I was like okay I I got it I, awesome. I'm okay I need to take like a second here and I I want to be cool and I want to like not be cool like you know but i i i, I want to help my kids and i want to guide them so i've got to kind of look at this a little bit and, and see what chapter we need to go to um, but do you have any books that you recommend or you know roby harris has an entire series and um that is and, and it's kind of stair steps up in developmental age and so it's you know it's not the stork and um i i forget the titles but they're they're wonderful but i do love it's perfectly normal i love that book um what i think is super important is finding those resources is it together and and showing kids and showing young people What's a reliable source? What's a source that aligns with our values? Um, how do we tailor our searches for what it is that we're looking for? And it's okay to find one answer and then be like, well, what's a different answer? And, and what does that mean? And why? And kind of go down the rabbit hole of some stuff. So, you know, establishing those values and having those conversations, I think that many of us, if you grew up Catholic, I, you probably got this message of, you know, you know, don't, don't become a teenage mom. And it's like, right. well, but, but why? And, and the why is really w more where it's at because it's not that being mm -hmm. a teenage mom, there's so much shame associated with that for so many horrible reasons and unhelpful reasons, but it's more around um, the matter of what, what do you want your life to look like? What do you want it to look like when you're able to raise children? Do you actually want children? Have you thought about that? 
So going backwards and establishing some of the whys for these directives, and that's where those conversations can be really rich and valuable. Remembering that, you know, if somebody decides to start engaging in these conversations for the first time when a kid is 15, 16, 17, they really have their own values formed by now. And it's, and, you know, shame on us as the adults for not exploring them earlier, but give the opportunity and create that platform and space for asking them how they formed their values and what they are. And then you can say, oh, well, you know, here, here are mine. And can we talk about where the overlaps are and where the differences are? And that's a really helpful tool. But, you know, it's, it's never too young to start. It's also never too late to start. Well, you have it in nature. I remember, I'm trying to think, we were at the San Diego Zoo. I'm trying to think how young my kids were. I mean, they were like very young. And we were in in front of the gorillas and it was right there. And it was, I mean, it was, it was so clearly human to me. You know what I mean? And it was like, mom, what, you know, like what's happening? Like, oh, well, you know, and then we had to describe in detail. Cause I think before I had been maybe a little more generic because we have a lot of friends that had babies in non-traditional ways. And so I was trying to be very inclusive, like not that like, oh, a mom and dad get married and have a baby. You know, I was trying right. to be like, oh, you know, when you choose to have a baby, whatever I was saying. But anyway, right. so then I was like, well, OK, let's <laughs> talk about what we just saw. There it was. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes in nature, you can be like, OK, that's what we were talking about. <laughs> totally. And I really love those found opportunities. Like if you're watching a show or a movie with, a, you know, a kid, a niece, a nephew, uh, you know, you're the, the second mom or something like that. And there's a teen scene that depicts something, whether it's positive or negative, I think that creates a wonderful opportunity to look at the young person you're with and say, what are your thoughts on that? Or is that something you've seen before? Or does that go on at your school? And notice by those examples of what I just said, we're not making it about the kid that you're sitting with. Have you ever done that? Oh God, no, mm. never say that to a child, never. Yeah. Um, you know. What, you know, have, have you ever done that? Has that ever happened to you? We don't want to put them on the spot. We want to create safety and a little bit of distance and a little bit of indirect query because then they're going to feel less threatened and less, you know, probed and interrogated and they won't shut down as easily. So if you ask, you know, what are the, what do you think the kids at school would say about that? Then they can speak on behalf of their peers and you can start to get a really nice and clear idea as to what the messages are around them that, that are resonating the most with them. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I, I just want to touch, I don't know if that resonated with you, Kelly, but when she said <laughs> Catholics are obsessed with teen moms, I don't, that is so funny because I don't, and I've been exploring that personally, like why is like, um, they're this big fear about getting pregnant as a teenager. Like, it's very weird to me. I know it's present and I know um, we actually had a lot of teen moms in our very, very small Catholic school. Because they would get kicked like, out of the public school and really? they would go to the Catholic school. Uh, well, also, um, we had friends practicing uh, natural family planning, which surprisingly well, isn't effective. <laughs> oh, don't even go there with my eighth grade sex ed and my charts of myself. But um, I think what's really messed up about that in the girls I did know who were my classmates or friends was that um, there was such this obligation to do what the boy wanted you to do, right? It was never like women owning, girls owning their sexuality, girls saying, I don't want to do that. Or if they enjoyed it to, did you enjoy, you know what I mean? Like the whole thing was a shame around not saying no, I feel like, and just letting things happen because you didn't want to lose your boyfriend. So to your point, it's such a broader, the teenage pregnancy is a broader, much broader issue, right? Than getting pregnant. It was something else. It's being lonely. It's wanting a relationship. It's not being cared for. There's other things that um, don't get addressed. And then there's, there is such shame with it. And then just, I mean, Jess, I don't know what, what you think, but it just, it it's sad. And I think for, for me, I see that now that I have, now that I'm a parent and it's like, I don't want my kids to, you know, first of all, we grew up in abstinence. There's no, there's no birth control. 
So, I mean, that was the other part, right? I mean, there's so many layers of it. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I said something to my son the other day and I recognize and I own it when I'm like, okay, guys, you're right. Like this was like my shame stuff. That was stuff about me and not you. Cause I said something like there was a girl in my school that bullied me. And I was like, and you know what? She ended up getting pregnant and like dropping out of school or something. And my son was like, mom, <laughs> These Gen Z and Gen A kids are so smart. He was like, mom, why are you acting like her having a baby means she isn't successful? And he was like, he was like, that doesn't mean anything. Okay. So her life choice, she had a baby as a teenager. And I was like, you're right, buddy. And I was like, you're right. And I was like, that's something I need to work on. And I've talked about like, you know, where I came from. But anyways, some weird stuff there. You know, that makes me think about another point in terms of our our ages and the opportunities that we have and the shaming that is so just built into our lives and that we think about. So I want you to picture yourself at a Fourth of July party or a Memorial Day barbecue or the Labor Day brunch or whatever. And you're around, you know, a mixed group of people. And it's some of them, you know, some of them you don't know. And somebody ends up, you know, spilling some tea and sharing gossip about somebody or someone shares something personal about themselves about, you know, maybe they like anal sex or maybe they, you know, did a quickie blowjob in a parking lot or something like that. And just think about how the crowd of people, even the nonverbals, the the shock, the horror, the like. Oh my God. If someone's sharing about somebody else, it might be like, Oh my God, she did what? And the immediate shame that we put typically on women and, and, you know, female identifying people, but that sends such a message. So let's say there's somebody else in that crowd who had had a similar experience. Now we've shut them down. We've reinforced any sense of shame they might've had. And we're really just, perpetuating this idea of women can't be powerful. Women can't express pleasure and sexual identity and all these things. And so we have to be, I, I think it's, it's helpful to be mindful of how we react when our friends on a one-on-one basis or in a group setting, whether it's personal or shared third party, but yeah, like you said about your son kind of calling you out on your stuff, we have to be careful that we're not doing those same things in our own circles. I, I think that's the one part that is so hard is, Jesse, we were just talking about that the other day, just the snap judgment. Like you, tr- I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to love everyone and be welcome with everybody. But then it's like these well-worn paths that you just have these judgments and you're like, I'm, I know that I don't want to be judging. And it's like, how do I continue to kind of practice that and catch myself? Because it doesn't, it doesn't, why do, why does it matter what other people want to do? And it's, I mean, that's why we started Chasing Brighter is really just living a life that you enjoy and doing things that um, make you happy. And it doesn't matter. Everybody has a different definition of that. Right. And when it comes to pleasure, it's the same as well. Right. But also, like, one of the things that I've had a hard time with was, um, you know, going through my own, like, sexual journey was, well, what do you like? Well, I don't know. Because a lot of it is, you know, it's a very, even to your point, Jesse, as a, as a woman, like, I have a very, maybe everyone's different, but for my life, I have a very limited lens. And I need to probably get a broader lens, but... You know, what does that entail? Is that like experimenting? Is that, you know, that's the stuff that gets, how do you deal with that with some of your, um, your patients? So one of the a really useful tool that I hand out and I have permission to share it from the creator of it. So I, I checked and made sure it was okay to distribute and it's called the yes, no, maybe list. Mm-hmm. And it's a pretty comprehensive, um, thorough, just document that lists all kinds of things. And the beauty of it is there's a glossary because a lot of people don't know what things are by name. So that's okay. So there's a glossary and then there's three columns. And one of them is yes. Like I'm totally down for that. I would love to try that. Or I have tried that. Or that sounds great. Consent permission. Yes, I would do that. No hard limit. I don't want to do it. I'm not interested in it. Don't ask. It's not up for discussion. No. And then maybe. And so if somebody checks, so what what I would say, what I have done in the past, if I'm working with a couple or a tryout or whatever, is everybody gets their own copy of this document and they fill it out by themselves. And then they come together and they share and they go down the list 
and they find the things that partners or people in the relationship or dynamic have said yes or maybe to, as well as no, so that we know what the no's are. But in terms of trying things, we stick with the yeses and the maybes, and then you negotiate. Well, is the maybe that it's, I only want to do that every now and then, I don't want that to become like an every time kind of thing, or... I want to talk about it and explore the parameters of it. You know, like, so let's say it's spanking. Maybe it's a maybe on somebody's list. Well, I want to make sure that there are no marks or I want to make sure it's only hands mm. or we can use a paddle, but not a whip. So those maybes just need to be fleshed out and talked about, but this is a nice tool. It's a great prop to start to talk about those kinds of things. Mm. And, and, and I design, I mean, the way I say to use this is make it light, make it laughable, make it hysterical. Like this should be a safe, fun activity for you and a partner or partners Mm -hmm. and just be like, Oh my God, you would do that. I would never do that. But, but not from a shame perspective. So there's a no on there. It's like, or there's a yes on there and somebody else that's a a squick and an icky. I don't like it. Be like, what is wrong with you? Why would you like that? That's mm. shaming. That's yeah. judging. So yeah. keeping that tone very light and inviting and accepting and embracing is key to going through that document. I love that. I just, I'm reading right now, Cheryl Strade, Cheryl Strade's book, Tiny Beautiful Things, where she uh-huh. was in the advice column, Dear Sugar. And she gave an example that her and her husband were dating and um, he spanked her butt and she was like, what's happening and she didn't know like what to so she said oh you know like she verbalized pleasure so then he verbalized more pleasure and then she was like sex from then on was him spanking her all the time and she did not like it and so he (laughs) said something like um you know well you really enjoy spanking so that's why i do it and she was like what and he was like well i don't like doing it to you but you really enjoy it and she was like i was letting you do it because you were saying and both of them were like we don't like it but they were it was like a month and that's like what sex had become and i think that's so funny and i definitely could see similar scenarios in my life and you're like okay what a perfect opportunity then to like let's bring this out and i'm gonna put spanking on the maybe so you're not thinking it's a yes <laughs> Totally. And there's so many things about that. I mean, there's so many, I think, you know, that, that gate, gatekeeper thing that you alluded to before and said, you know, the pressure is on the girls to, you know, in a, in a heteronormative world that we live in, unfortunately, it's just, that's the lens that we get so much information and so many things are couched around, but that girls are the gatekeepers. We're the ones that are supposed to be, you know, we, we, we control the flow. Yes. So we either open or close the gates, depending mm-hmm. on whatever. And God knows we don't know what to make it depend on. We're never taught what to make it depend on. But, you know, conversely, boys are given the message that they need to keep going. They need to keep trying that their value and their worth is based on how conquering they are. And and I, I think some of that is starting, starting to get outdated. But but all we need to do is look around and see the the dynamics of rape culture in our world to see that that's not gone yet. Yeah. So, you know, um, so having those conversations and giving everyone in the dynamic a voice and the power to say, I do like this and to say it without shame and without judgment, or I don't like this and to do that without shame or without judgment is really a key to connectivity and to making sure that people feel respected and valued in a relationship I think that's those are wonderful conversations to have and they can be super fun and super, as you found out, enlightening. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, and I and I know um, because you've talked about working um, with weight, with rape crisis and healing from trauma and sexual assault, but also um, and I think that's also where I come from sex positive where it's like, I don't want it to be like this. How do you prevent rape? <laughs> you know, right. like, I feel like that's but it's like, no, but it's like right it can be fun and pleasurable and exploring and and physical connection is healthy for us i mean do you think that sex and physical connection can benefit our overall health and well-being they absolutely do um you know there's a real thing a real physiological um phenomenon called skin hunger and basically we have a an innate physiological need for touch Mm. and so um, now I don't want anyone to mishear that and say that that means that somebody can who is who has skin hunger can go out there and touch you know not without consent. That isn't what I mean. But what I what I do mean is that people can sort of long for that touch and make 
interesting and, and, you know, maybe not aligned decisions with them, with their own value systems because of skin hunger. So we, we touch can be touch and, and sensuality and intimacy and physical connection. They increase our serotonin. They increase our dopamine. They can act as an analgesic and an anesthetic. They can be a pain reliever. They're definitely a stress reliever. You know, a great orgasm can lead to better sleep. It can lead to, you know, pain relief. There's so many wonderful physical benefits from having physical connection and intimacy and that kind of thing that, yes, I definitely believe that it can um, help, you know, form those stronger connections and greater emotional bonds. Yeah. Have you seen, I mean, just even coming out of COVID where people were so isolated and just even um, not able to kind of touch people, it feels awkward sometimes. Have you seen that too? And just how that's changed? Definitely. I'm coming out of COVID. I mean, even when I'm greeting new, new clients at my office, I stand there really awkwardly and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to shake hands or not. And whereas before I would have done it automatically with a new client, like, hello, nice to meet you. Welcome, whatever. Now I just stand there and go, are we supposed to shake hands? And I, I think that there are a lot of folks who are having that kind of, you know, same experience, especially coming out of COVID where we've been isolated. And, you know, I think as we look at the younger folks that have so much digital connection and very and much more restricted and, and not as much access to in real life connect, physical connection, they don't know how to initiate physical touch and have different needs and, and different awkwardnesses and confusion. And so, yeah, and, and with everything in the media, sort of all the messages, get consent and you must have consent and making this big deal. Nobody can take a joke and no one has a sense of humor and everything is so confusing. And I think that it does need some clarification and I think tools are great, but I think it can be a lot simpler than it's being made out to be. And it can be just like, Hey, I, I would love to offer you a hug. How do you feel about that? Or is it okay if I kiss you or how do you feel about holding hands? Or can I come sit closer to you on the couch? Just ask. Well, I I totally agree. I think what we're getting away from in a lot of ways is just letting things, like dealing with things one-on-one, right? In some way where if somebody's hurt, the parent calls the school, the school deals with it versus like getting the two kids to sit down and talk through stuff or how, and so how friendships and other relationships are impacted, especially with younger folks, um, is just very different. Right. And I think for us, a lot of us, you know, those kind of conversations are challenging as adults. And I mean, the ability to kind of nurture, nurture that with younger folks so that they can have that going back to your point about these foundations of values that you kind of start to build. It brings me to such a great example and exactly what you're talking about and teaching kids about consent from an early age. So we've we've all and probably m- many folks have seen this, but it's worth talking about when a kid is, you know, two, three, four years old, five, six, seven, and uncle whatever comes over, or Aunt Bippy comes over and Aunt Bippy wants a hug or wants a kiss. And parents who encourage or enable Aunt Bippy to be like, you have, to, I'm your Aunt Bippy. You must give me a hug. Come here. I don't, that's okay. And then the kid has no bodily, bodily autonomy. And so the message that gets sent is you're not in control of who touches you. You, you can say you don't want to, but there are going to be people in your lives who get to have say over your body. And I just wish that as adults and as parents, we would, take that opportunity to break that chain and look at aunt Bippy and say, you know what, if Johnny didn't want a hug, Johnny doesn't have to have a hug and that's okay. And we're not going to make Johnny hug if, if he doesn't want to. So I think it's a great opportunity to start at little, you know, Mm -hmm. so we we're going to teach those values and teach those habits on the playground, you know, you know, would you like to play with this toy? Ask to play with the toy. Don't just take the toy. And if your feelings are hurt, that the toy was taken from you, we don't hit, we say, I didn't like that you took my toy. I want my toy back. And not like, you know, we've got to teach assertiveness. And there are so many times where I hear from, it's great, I, when I work with women and, and female identifying people who grow up in our culture, who think assertiveness equals bitchiness. So when I demonstrate what assertive communication sounds like, I get so many 
girls and women and female identifying people who then say to me, oh, so you mean to like be a bitch? And I'm like, no, be assertive. Let me demonstrate to you what a bitch sounds like. And then I would get what I would describe as aggressive communication style. Mm -hmm. But we grow up, we, I'm identifying as a, as a female in our culture, we grow up hearing that assertive equals bitchy, demanding, inappropriate, unacceptable, Mm -hmm. that we lose our assertive voice and we end up doing that people pleasing. We end up doing the blowjob because we don't want to lose the boyfriend. We also end up doing that because of our culture and our, our safety. So I remember telling, you know, explaining to somebody, a a guy friend of mine, a a good guy, a a decent dude. And just remember saying to him that, you know, there are times when I get out of my car to pump gas and I happen to be wearing some kind of dress that's a little more figure hugging or something, or I have, you know, I'm I'm bigger breasted than some other women and my boobs stand out in, in certain clothes. So when I get out of the car to pump gas, I look around And I assess and I see if there's like, you know, a single guy there and I have to kind of steel myself against the, the, hey, or how are you doing? Or hello, pretty lady. And then the scan up and down my body. And in a moment, in a millisecond, I have to decide, do I want to smile and giggle? Do I want to say hi? Do I want to be silent and pretend I didn't notice him? Do I want to be like, don't talk to me like that? Or why are you addressing me that way? I had to decide in a split second. And I believe that nearly every single female identifying person that I know has had that occasion where if we don't do the the smile and the giggle, we start to feel unsafe or we have been harmed, whether it's verbally or someone comes into our personal space or we've actually been assaulted or somebody, you know, yells at us or spits at us or calls us a name. So we have to navigate this ridiculous line of like, how do we exist in this space where we we own our bodies and we own everything about us, but we also stay safe and we also find pleasure and we also say, I'm allowed. And it gets so confusing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I there's some there's so much to unpack there, but I know um and Glennon Doyle's podcast, I don't know if someone wrote in, but she was like, people are saying I hate men. And she said, I don't hate men. I hate the men costume. And I and I don't like when I wear the, the female costume. And she was giving an example of she was at the grocery store and a man put his hand on her back. And she was like... <laughs> you know, and just latched it off. And she was like, I hated myself. I don't know why my instinct was to please him, <clears throat> to not make him upset. And she was like, anybody listening, if you're wondering, hey, should I put my hand on this person's back? The answer is no. She was like, no, don't put your hand on the person's back. And with like the hugging and the kids, it's like I, I because I focus on trauma and so many of the, my clients have been raped and sexual abused by the aunt and the uncle and whatnot. And and they were told, why aren't you hugging uncle so-and-so um, that it was like pretty early on that with the kids. And even with my husband, who's tickling them. I know I feel like I'm such, <laughs> I'm so like over whatever I'm a lot, but I'm like, Oh, you need to ask when they're saying, stop, you need to stop when you're tickling and you know, and I'll, and even to them and I'm not perfect, but I want to say, give me a kiss when they're little and I want to squish a little cheeks. And I want to kiss. But I'm like, can I kiss you know can I have a kiss and I'll ask my you know may have a hug may have a kiss even me and it's like oh do you want to give them a hug hello or hug goodbye and I'm not 100% perfect but I think just because of my work background of knowing those no means no so when they're playing and one sibling says no I'm like no means no you know like running and no means no (laughs) about boundaries so young (laughs) And I think in that, you know, in, in time, what that does is that really helps. And that's going to help with connection later on because people are going to have their voice and they're going to be so much more comfortable with saying, well, that does work for me and that doesn't work for me. And hey, when you did that, that actually kind of bummed me out and I didn't like it. And I feel like it's okay to tell you. And it just having that voice and teaching that value and teaching that pattern and role modeling those behaviors of consent and discussion is wonderful. And that is planting a seed in their minds. And if we ever wonder or worry, if it's not, just think about the converse. When we are forced mm-hmm. to give Aunt Bippy that hug, so many of us lose that idea that yeah. we have any control over our bodies. Well, and, and- 
there was a huge backlash. I think it was Antioch College that came out with their consent thing in the 90s. There was huge backlash about it and people making fun of it. But like, I would feel so attended to by a lover if they were like, is this okay? Is this okay? Can I do this? I wouldn't be like, this is annoying. Stop asking me. I would be like, oh my goodness, look how attentive this lover is. This is wonderful. So I think that would be wonderful. I know, Kelly, does that sound annoying to you? I think that would be wonderful if someone kept asking. No, it doesn't sound annoying. It's just, again, I think there's a combination of things which I'm still trying to unpack myself, which is being assertive or like having a voice and knowing I have a voice and it's okay to use the voice. And people just need to know right? Um, just getting out of the, the mode of being a people pleaser is a really hard thing to, to do, um, to find your own path. Um, but now that I'm older, yeah, Jess, I agree. I appreciate when I'm being asked if I like something. Yeah. I mean, I, I've even, I'm single and i um, been single a long time and I go out and date and God knows in Vegas, it's um, interesting to say the least. Um, but there have definitely been times where I've been out on, you know, whether it's a first, second, third or fifth date. And I just feel like I, I have this feeling and I, I want to put it out there and I want to like take it, you know, either off the table or on the table. And I just share, um, you know, Hey, I just want to let you know, I, I, I don't intend on having sex tonight or, you know, just so that we're clear, you know, you're not coming home with me tonight or something like that. And Honestly, I've never had a bad reaction. And the interesting thing is, if I did, what a great data point I've just discovered. Yeah. If somebody mm -hmm. had a bad reaction to that, now I know that the date's over right now. So I've, you know, it's like, so, I mean, it's been lovely and, and empowering and, and enlightening finding that voice. And, and you're right. I know. And in my 50s, I have, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I have no fucks left to give. So, <laughs> I just, I, I don't care. I'm going to say what I want to say. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not disrespectful. I value what other people have to say and I will respect their boundaries also, but I'm much more clear about mine. And what it does is it establishes my standards and yeah. what I will accept and tolerate. And it sets those, the bar high to say like, yeah, if you do something that I don't like, I'm going to tell you about it. And that just fosters better communication. I know you talked a little bit about, but like there is some entitlement still out there, right? Um, in the male population. And I do, it's, it's strange to me. And I was, my husband completely disagrees with this because he is, um, very much a person that would clearly get consent and he doesn't understand like if there was a no, he would be like, bam. And so I was talking to him about, well, you know, like there are, um, I'm going to say boys in, in that book, Girls and Sex, right? Like college males who, I don't think they knew they raped the girl. And the girls, like they left and they were like, thank you. And they didn't know what to do. And they, you know, left the room. And it was like, because they had said no. And, and so he was like, I don't, you know, he was having a hard time processing that because he was just like, there was a no. That's it. How do they not know they did it? But I really think there are situations where they don't even know they're assaulting anyone um and and so i i just i think it is so ambiguous and confusion and i'm not trying to s say this person's innocent or whatever but i do i do think that assertiveness is fine and okay and i don't think like your experience people are offended i don't think anybody has any idea everyone's going out there and like you say in our culture you know and in, in the american culture in our society uh and and with our puritanical roots um i don't think anybody has any idea and so if you're going to it, it's like someone's got to say something because no one has any idea. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> you know, I, I, and this has been about 10 years um, or, or no, a little longer probably, but I will never forget this. Um, there was a school when I still worked at Planned Parenthood, there was a school, a charter school here in town that I taught at. I was a guest speaker and I was there for years and years. And I mean, I was there in young as fifth grade through high school. So I got to know these kids because they showed up in the fifth grade class and then in the sixth grade class and the seventh and eighth. And what they did, what they chose to do at this particular school was um, break the kids up depending on the year. Every now and then they changed it up, you know, administration wise. But they, they gender segregated the kids for these lessons, which I wasn't hugely a fan of, but it was better than not having the education. So I was in a room of ninth grade boys. And... I was was doing a lesson on something on, on you know, consent or sort of communication or whatever, you know, how to a strong no message or whatever. 
And I really thought that I was lobbing a softball when I said to the group, there's been 25 ninth grade boys. I said, okay, so what do you do if you're out with a girl or a partner and, you know, you try to make a move and they say, you know, no. And a kid raises their hand, a kid raises his hand and he goes, you ask him again. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, and I just called on somebody else. And it escalated to the point, not a single kid said anything other than something that would fall under coercion, manipulation, pressure. Like you just, you keep asking until they say yes, or you do it again, or, wow. and, and now what was fascinating and so telling and so compelling for me was it happened to be a day that the high school principal decided to observe the high school principal was sitting in the back corner of the room. Luckily, he was sitting in the back corner. So I could just, and I let this discussion continue. I mean, I was my, I was managing the classroom, but I was letting the discussion continue. And, and I was obviously going to get to the point of none of those things. I was waiting for the one kid who said, you stop. I was waiting for that kid. But this high school principal who himself was a grown adult man, his mouth just, his eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger and his mouth dropped lower and lower and lower. And I felt like it was so important for him to have witnessed that that is the culture and that is what all these boys, yeah. and, and they, they didn't mean it. They, 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 they really thought that they were getting the right answer. And, yeah. and it was, it, when we got to the point where I said, you know, no, you, once somebody says that they don't want to do it or you get a no from them, you stop. They went, Oh, and they kind of, they, they, they accepted it. They were fine with it. And then I was a, a traveling teacher, guest instructor. So I had another class to get to. So I'm packing up all my stuff, my easel pad and my, you know, my markers and my whatever. And two of the boys were so sweet. They're like, Miss Laura, Miss Laura, can we help you? Can we help? We'll, we'll take your stuff. And I said, great. And so I'm walking with them to the next class. And I took that opportunity to look at them and say, you, got, you guys know Miss Laura's single because we, we've talked about it. And I'm like, you know, Miss Laura's single. I said, how how would you feel if a if a man that I went out with would have would have done the things that you boys were describing? And their chest puffed up and they got all big and they go, No disrespect, Miss Laura, but 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 I kick his ass. And I'm like, right. So why would it be okay? And they kind of just sat there and looked at me and they got all, you know, their, their shoulders slumped and they got all hang dog and they looked down and, but it was, and, and I loved that moment. I loved both of the moments of, you know, the, the, the principal observing this and then the kids really having that real life kind of, wait a minute, I, I, they got slapped in the face with their messaging and realized that it was not okay. And I found it such a powerful opportunity and powerful lesson. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I'm getting at, right? That, that they don't, it's not um, necessarily this planned opportunity for sexual assault. It really is not knowing how to respect a boundary and not mm -hmm. knowing, you know, like we're, we're talking about, no one's having those conversations of like, no means no, right? Like when they're forced to hug their aunt and uncle and they're forced to like, oh yeah, well, remember I said no and I had to keep going. So that's what you do in situations, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and remembering that, that, you know, all of that is sort of what they're not getting, but what they are getting is all this rape culture pressure yeah. that's everywhere that's telling them all these messages. <laughs> so they yeah. were just repeating back what they've been hearing. And so we need to provide a counterbalance to that and, and to everybody. Like, this doesn't matter about gender. It, like, everyone needs to get all the same messaging that, yeah. you know, consent yeah. is, yeah. Is, re is required. Consent is essential. Consent can be a fun conversation and can lead to connectivity and, and better relationships and better outcomes and, and just better relationships. Yeah. And I, and I love, I know, um, I, I love the, the yes, no, maybe list. And I, um, I love that. Um, what are some other things that maybe you kind of find yourself repeating a lot or recommending or saying? You know, it depends on the it depends on the people that I'm working with. So, like, let's say we're talking about porn consumption with you know adults, and so and and there's not necessarily a a, a strong adverse reaction. You know, somebody isn't having the whole like, oh my god, I could never. You know, they're like, well, yeah, porn's all right. 
So what I might do is say, okay, why don't you guys one one day, one night, pull up the computer, go to a site like YouPorn or, you know, RedTube or, you know, what, and I'll give them a few sites to look at and go through the categories and pick out a couple that you think you might be interested in or that somebody knows they're interested in and, you know, come up with some different genres of things that you like and maybe watch it together, make it, you know, use it as a prelude to an experience that, that you'd have. Another thing that that I would suggest is something, you know, erotica, good old fashioned erotica, you know, and now there's some, you know, literotica. So like the literature around, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and find it, you can find it online, you know, you can find it in actual bookstores, but maybe read passages to each other, read something sexy to each other. Um, Another thing is have have a time where you sit and share fantasies and make it a safe space. So make it that, you know, it's a, a shared listening thing where it's like, I'm going to share a fantasy that lives in my brain. I don't know that I ever want to enact it in real life, but this is something that goes through my mind. And then you take turns sharing those fantasies. And then there can be the opportunity, do you, you know, are we interested in making any of these come true? Like, is that something that you wanted to try out in real life? You know, I think going and exploring a, an adult toy store is a super fun activity to break the ice and 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 have those giggly fun times about things we might want to try or you know what is that or let's explore that together or let's make each other feel better about these conversations by going to the store together and interacting with the you know the clerk. So I know some of those things are terrifying and people <laughs> I know that I might be just terrifying your listeners but Honestly, like if you don't have the trust and the dynamic and the comfort with these kinds of experiences, I encourage you to step back and figure out why you don't and what Mm. you need to build up that comfort in your relationship, because what else isn't comfortable? Yeah. Can you not talk about money? Can you not talk about discipline Mm -hmm. if you have children together? Can you not talk about um, your, your retirement goals? Like, if you don't have the comfort, to me, that's a much bigger red flag about how connected you are and what do you need to build that connection? Or maybe you can say, I really want to do this and I'm scared and here's why I'm scared. And I'm hoping that you can hear this and we can have this conversation safely. And that's like, you know, backing up 15 steps. So maybe mm-hmm. that's a place where, you know, everyone, everyone comes to this from a different experience level. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think also just even from myself being married for um, like 15, 16 years is also, I think it could be fun to mix it when you're in a longer term relationship to mix it up a little bit. Right. Um, You really start to get into this pattern of doldrums, even in your sex life. Um, So those tips are really great. I think just to kind of spice it up as well. There are some really lovely books. Laura Korn is the author and it's like 101 um, quickies and 52 mm. limitations to great sex. There's, and they're really lovely and they're, they're physical paper books. And, and, and I'm sure there's a digital version of them, but the paper ones are so much fun because they're literally tear outs. And so basically they vary and, and she has a whole series of them and I find them lovely. And there's little like icons and codes, like how many dollar signs and does this one involve food and does this one involve transportation? And, and oh, so cool. it does all the thinking for you. And it even sets up how to leave the invitation and how to respond. So for, you know, long-term couples or shorter term couples or whatever, I think those are really lovely resources to help spice things up and just to add something. I think, you know, I think one of the neat things is I I hear this a lot about vacation sex, hotel sex. And I think that's a a great thing to think about in terms of folks that have been in longer relationships to kind of break up those doldrums is, you know, maybe we try something new. We each come up with two or three ideas that we want to try on, you know, hotel vacation sex. And then, you know, you, you have that opportunity to share and be in a different setting. And, you know, if it's nerve wracking, you can kind of, it doesn't, um, it doesn't create an awkward situation in your own bedroom and therefore change that mm-hmm. energy in your bedroom. Um, so I think that's a great, you know, yeah, easy- and, I, well, and I like the idea of like a book or a reference. I want to say, um, so my husband was raised in a similar 
home that I was, and I want to say we were married like 20 years before we started having these conversations of like, <laughs> I'm super fucked up from my childhood and sex. And he's like, I'm super repressed as well. <laughs> and then it's like, hey, what about, and he was like, you go, like, if we talk about it, like, oh, maybe change things up. He's like, you go from like one to a hundred. We're like, whoa, let's do this. And he was like, and that's like, whoa. So then he's like, that's here, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, if there was like a book, right. Or like the yes, no, maybe where you're like, okay, well, let's look through here. Like, what's a one or two for you? Okay. Right. Because, you know, where you're just grasping at things, right? You don't know what's uh, like super uncomfortable for someone and what's like. And yeah, they totally. don't That's spend any time talking about this in your pre Cana marriage class in the Catholic no, Church they either. Didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Surprisingly, that would, be the great? Priest, that would almost be even better than anything else. <laughs> So I think another really good book just for folks to read so that they can start to have those conversations is The Ethical Slut. That's a wonderful like that. book. Oh, cool. It's great. Okay. Like, to me, that's like, I don't know. It, uh, it's not a primer, but it it definitely explores. It creates an opportunity to share those values, explorations with a partner and to share those conversations as to, you know, like, I think there are so many things people take for granted and just assume and somebody else has vastly different assumptions and you've never had the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is create so many horrible opportunities for miscommunication and breaking connection. And what a shame, like what a shame that is. Yeah. Well, and that's like, I was, that's what I was like telling my, my daughter that it's like never, never, ever, ever have sex. And then you're married and supposed to know. And it's so funny because I look back, it's so dumb. So my husband and I started dating when we were like 19 and 20 um and he had more you know partners and so it's so dumb that like for 20 plus years i thought he was like so much more experienced and i'm like we were like 19 and 20 when we got together that's so dumb to think whoa woo he's been around the block and it's like (laughs) none of us have any idea what is happening because we were so young and um it's just it is it's kind of funny then you know then to explore and have those conversations because you don't know where the other person is coming from right there are just so many wonderful opportunities to create the conversations and so many lost opportunities that end up happening. And, and if, if people would figure out what are, what are they most afraid of by bringing it up and tackle the fear yeah. first, then they can go forward mm-hmm. with having the conversation. And even so for, for people out there who are listening to this and they're like, I don't even know where to start bookmark this and then get with your partner and be like, there's a podcast I want you to listen to and don't say anything else and just sit and listen to it together. And then maybe at the end say, so what did you think? Or what's something you've always wanted to ask me? Or, you know, what's something that, you know, you think that I don't know about you or let this be the jumping off point if you've got nothing else. Yeah. And I I like what you're saying, like, if you're afraid to address this, what is, what needs to be improved in the relationship then if, yeah. if you're not at a ability to, to have conversations right? like that. Um, this was so wonderful. Yeah. I feel like we talked so, we, we talked about like everything, which I mm-hmm. love. So this was so good. Yeah. This was really helpful. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was super fun. Thanks for listening and joining us today. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Chasing Brighter or on our blog, ChasingBrighter.com.